All right, so last time we looked at some arguments against hedonism, and now we have another reading from The Ethical Life, uh, our reader with primary sources. And we have a selection from a book by Robert Nozick. Robert Nozick was, was a 20th century American philosopher, and he was a sharp critic of hedonism uh, as a theory of value. So we looked at some arguments against hedonism last time. Let's take a look at Nozick's uh, argument. <clears throat> Nozick's argument uh, is presented in, by um, way of a thought experiment. So, as I mentioned, bef as I have mentioned before, oftentimes philosophy proceeds by thought experiments. It's not a empirical science like chemistry or physics, obviously, where you can go into a lab and test a hypothesis. Uh, by making some kind of observation. Oftentimes, the way that philosophy works, by way of contrast, is we think about different possible states of affairs, or, or theoretically possible states of affairs, even if they're not states of affairs that actually exist or may not actually ever exist, but at least they're logically possible. And we think about if that scenario did exist, what would be the logical consequences. And that's how we sometimes come to certain philosophical insights. And Nozick, uh, his uh, criticism of hedonism begins with a thought experiment that has come to be known in the ethics literature, literature as the uh, experience machine thought experiment. So this is the way he explains it. This is on page 21 of our reader, The Ethical Life. Nozick writes, Suppose there were an experience machine that could give you any experience you desired. Super-duper neuropsychologists could stimulate your brain so that you would think and feel you were writing a great novel or making a friend or reading an interesting book. All the time you would be floating in a tank with electrodes attached to your brain. Should you plug into this machine for life, pre-programming your life's experiences? And uh, he continues on. <clears throat> uh, while, of course, a little further down, this is on page 22. <clears throat> while in the tank, you won't know that you're there. You'll, you'll think it's all actually happening. And you can plug in any experiences that you want. You can pre-program all, all of the experiences that you want into the experience machine. So that's the, here again, the, the, the hypothetical scenario. <clears throat> and then he goes on to ask, uh, would you plug in? Um, he thinks that most people would not. And the fact that most people would not, he goes on to argue, shows that hedonism as a theory of value uh, can't be right. So why, why is it that he thinks? Why is it that most people would not choose to plug into an experience machine and just have this virtual life, just this stream of virtual experiences? <clears throat> Even if they were all happy experiences. Here again, if you were pre-programming before you stepped into the machine, if you were pre-programming all of the experiences, uh, you would program only good ones. You would program only happy ones. So it would be uh, a happy life in, in the sense of uh, a life characterized only by enjoyment, but it's a life that most of us, I, I think Nozick is correct to say, most of us would not choose. So what does that show about the hedonist thesis? Again, the hedonist thesis is that the one intrinsic value, the good, the source of all value is, is happiness, pleasure slash happiness. But again, like some of the arguments that we talked about last time, this thought experiment seems to show that there are other things that we care about. How does the experience machine thought experiment bring out some of the other things that we care about? Well, one way that Nozick makes the point is to say that what makes for a good life is not only the quality of one's experiences. Other things matter to us besides, uh, as he wrote, how our lives feel from the inside, unquote. Uh, and so to paraphrase his argument, hedonism goes wrong in placing all the value in life on the subjective character of our experiences rather than certain objective facts about us. 
So in the first lecture we talked about uh, the difference between objective truths and subjective truths. Subjective truths are truths are statements that are true because of the, the way that they depend on the individual's beliefs or experiences or preference or preferences or attitudes, something like that. Uh, as we said in the first lecture, an objective fact is a fact that does not depend on any individual's experiences for its truth. Uh, an objective truth is a statement that is true and its truth doesn't depend on any one individual's experience or experience or point of view or, or likes or beliefs or anything like that. <clears throat> so what the experience machine thought experiment seems to show is that here again, the subjective character of our experiences, that is, the, that is to say the way that our lives feel to us or the way that they seem to us or the way that we experience them. Um, this is not the only important thing in life. It's true that we do want to have, and this is where, this is why maybe hedonism seems plausible at first glance. It is true that we want to have enjoyable experiences. Of course, that's true. But where hedonism may go wrong is in thinking that that is the only intrinsic value, namely enjoyment is the only intrinsic value. <clears throat> or is even uh, the most important uh, intrinsic value. That, that, that may not be the case. The experience machine thought experiment seems to show that we do care about the objective facts about ourselves. What is the truth about myself? Quite apart from how I feel about myself. <clears throat> Here again, a subjective truth is a truth that depends on your beliefs, but an objective truth doesn't. And the experience machine thought experiment seems to bring out that we do care about the objective truth about ourselves. We do care about the reality of our lives, the reality about ourselves. <clears throat> your beliefs about yourself may not be the same as the objective truth, the reality about yourself. So what would be, what would be an example? Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Happy Gilmore in which Adam Sandler plays uh, a hockey player who isn't very good. <laughs> he, uh, he believes that he's good, but the objective truth about himself is that he's not very good. And so that is a source of a lot of uh, frustration to him and uh, personal conflict and uh, anger issues and so forth um, because there's a, a a mismatch between his belief about himself on the one hand and the truth the objective truth about himself on the other hand so there's a difference between those two um, we want Nas goes on to argue in, in in this passage that we that we have goes on to argue that we want certain things about ourselves to be true, not, not just to feel true, not just to seem true. We don't just want to believe that we've achieved some goal or, or we've become a, a certain kind of person. We want to actually be in reality. We want the objective truth our, about ourselves to be that we have achieved that goal or, or become that kind of person. We want to have certain traits of character, for example, certain virtues. But we don't just want to feel like we do. We want to. We want that to be the objective truth about ourselves, or at least here again, that's what Nozick thinks that the thought experiment shows. So you'll have to decide for yourself what to, what to think about that. So what makes for a good life is not only the quality of one's experiences. Other things matter to us besides the subjective character of our experiences, or again, how our lives feel to us. Mm -mm. We also care about certain objective facts about ourselves. What is the objective truth about myself? I care about that. What kind of person am I really? Not just how I may think that I am or feel that I am or believe that I am, but, but objectively, what is the truth about myself? We do care about that as well. That's why, again, Nozick thinks most people would not choose to enter in this uh, experience machine and just have a life of virtual experiences. They would all be enjoyable experiences, but most people wouldn't do it. And Nozick thinks that shows that hedonism as a theory of value can't be right. <clears throat> so we've talked about objectivist versus subjectivist views of moral knowledge in the first lecture. And in what Nozick is saying here, there's there are really two possible views that one could take on the question of the value of a life or just value more generally, but let's just focus more specifically 
on different philosophical approaches to the value of a life, to this issue of how well your life is going, how good your life is. We've seen that hedonism says your life is going well to the extent that you're having enjoyable experiences, to the extent that you're experiencing pleasure and, and happiness. That's what determines how good your life is. In hedonism, it comes down to experiences. <clears throat> but as we've seen, Nozick thinks we care about more than just the experiences that we have. We care uh, about certain objective facts about ourselves and what they are. So implicit in what Nozick is saying here would be two different philosophical approaches, or uh, here again, implicit in the way that he's setting up the problem, I guess I should say, because clearly Nozick is a kind of objectivist. But implicit in the philosophical problem, as he explains it, would be two different approaches that one could take to this question of what makes a life a good life. The subjectivist thesis would be, if you feel that your life is going well, then it is. You can't be wrong about whether your life is going well. <clears throat> now, here again, you, you, you know whether you're happy or not. You, you know whether you're enjoying yourself or not, right? You can't be wrong about those kinds of subjective truth claims. <clears throat> but Nozick's point is that you might very well know that you are happy, know that you are enjoying yourself, knowing, know that you are experiencing pleasure or happiness, and still not know everything that there is to know about yourself. There might be larger objective facts about yourself <clears throat> that maybe you don't know. Um, but you ought to care about those as well. And it seems like most people do. That seems to be the thrust of his thought experiment. So the object of his thesis would be that how well your life is going is determined by certain objective facts about you, not just how your life feels or how it seems to you to be going. You can be wrong in thinking that your life is going well. So here again, when it comes to certain, when it comes to subjective truths, like uh, to go back to some of the examples I've given before, it feels warm in here to me, or the soup tastes too salty to me, something like that, or uh, I found the movie to be hilarious, something like that. Um, of course, you can't be wrong about what your experiences are. Those are all subjective truths. They're truths that depend, statements that depend for their truth on the individual's experience or belief. But when it comes to this question of the value of a good life, is that all that matters? Simply the subjective character of your experiences here again. The object of his thesis is that no, you, you could be, of course you can't be wrong in thinking that you're enjoying yourself. You know what your experience is. You can't be wrong in thinking that you're happy. But, on the object of his think thesis, you can be wrong in thinking that your life is going well. So, for example, if uh, here again, we talked last time about false happiness scenarios. We talked last time about Schaefer Landau's example of two women. They're both equally happy. So the two lives are equally happy lives. <clears throat> in the, in the uh, first case, the woman's happiness is based on the true belief that her husband is faithful to her. In the second case, the woman's happiness is based on the false belief that her husband is faithful to her. Now, the subjective character of those two lives is the same. They're equally happy. And yet we said last time, it seems to most people that the first life is better than the second life. Why is that? Well, I think we get a little bit more of a sense uh, of why most people react to that thought experiment in, in that way when we look at this distinction between subjectivist and objectivist thesis about the value of a life. As we've seen, the objectivist thesis, the view, Nozick's view, is that how well your life is going is determined by certain objective facts about you, and you can be wrong in thinking that your life is going well. So most people, in thinking about that thought experiment that we discussed last time, would say, that, be, that although the woman in the second case thinks that her life is going well, she's wrong because her happiness is based on a deception. It's based on uh, an illusion. It's based on uh, false beliefs about 
what is the objective truth about her life. She believes that she has a faithful husband. But the objective truth about her life is that she does not. Now, she's happy because she doesn't know. But here again, in the case of that thought experiment, most people would say the first life is a better life. Because in the first life, the happiness is based on the objective, the woman's, the objective truth about the woman's life. So thinking back to that thought experiment, I think that helps to bring out the difference between these two different philosophical theses that one could take on the issue of the value of a life. Uh, to, put, uh, to explain the distinction uh, a slightly different way, on the subject of this view of value, your life is going just as well as you think it is. Whether your life is going well is a first-person evaluation. So that can be determined from the point of view of the individual. So when I say a first-person evaluation, what is the first-person singular pronoun? I, right? I believe that my life is going well. Therefore, it is. That's what I mean here by a first-person evaluation. The objectivist view of value is that a life can't be a truly good one if it's based on deception or ignorance. How well your life is going is a third-person evaluation. So that can only be made from the point of view of an objective observer, ultimately. So if he, what, what are the third-person uh, pronouns? He or she or they. If he or she or they, somebody outside of yourself, that is to say, somebody outside of the point of view of the I, so to speak, Excuse me. If uh, if objective observers looking out at all the facts and knowing all the objective truths about your life, if that were somehow possible, came to the conclusion that your life is a good life, then that's what makes it a good life. So here again, to think back to the Schaefer Landau's thought experiment from the last chapter, a third person evaluation of the second woman's life would be, although she believes her husband is faithful and she's happy the objective truth about her is that her about her life is that her husband is not faithful so from this third person evaluation uh, he or she or they that is to say this objective observer can see that it's not a good life so that's another way to understand this difference between two different approaches one could take to this philosophical question to do with the value of a life <clears throat> Nozick reflects on this thought experiment and he thinks what it shows is that we want to do certain things, not just have the experience of doing them. So again, the idea of the experience machine is that you would plug in all kinds of enjoyable experiences. <clears throat> but why would most people choose not to do that? Here again, Nozick thinks that most people would choose not to enter the experience machine, not to... What we really mean here is enter it for the rest of your life, right? I mean, of course, anyone would do it just for a short time. But but if you had to choose, do I want to spend the rest of my life in an experience machine just having virtual experiences? Or do I want to live in reality? He thinks most people would choose to live in reality, even if that meant that their lives would have less enjoyment, less happiness. Because we want to do certain things, not just have the experience of doing them, as, as Nas points out. So hedonism seems to get the direction of explanation wrong. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> it's true that we want to have enjoyable experiences. It's true that we want to be happy. But as Nozick puts the point here, again, I'm paraphrasing, but it's because we want to do certain things that have intrinsic value, that is to say value in themselves, that we want to have the experience of doing them not the other way around, as hedonism seems to mistakenly assume. So if you want um, to be a great uh, mountain climber or mathematician or athlete, it's not, we, we do want to have the experience uh, of achieving those goals. You know, we do want to have the experience of climbing a mountain or winning a race or solving a problem in science or math. We, we, we do want to have the experience, but we want to have the experience because we want to actually do it. It's not the other way around, as hedonism seems to mistakenly assume. It's not that we want to have the experience and therefore we want to do it. It's the other way around. We want to actually do it, and that's why we want to have the experience. We want to actually win the race. 
We do want to have the experience of it as well, but we want to have the experience because the objective truth is we have won the race. We have achieved that goal in reality. So hedonism seems to get the direction of explanation backwards. It's true we want to have certain experiences, but that's not why we strive to achieve the goals, strive to do the things that we aim for. It's the other way around. He, or at least Nozick would argue, we want to achieve those things. We want to achieve those goals that have value in themselves, and it's because we want to achieve them that we want to experience the enjoyment that would come with accomplishing those goals. <clears throat> We want to be a certain way, Nozick says. We want to be a certain sort of person. And this fact seems to show that the virtues have intrinsic value. <clears throat> so there are certain traits of character that we want to have, traits of character that we think of as good traits of character, virtues that we think of as ethically good traits of character. We want to be um, brave, courageous, loyal, generous, trustworthy, reliable, gracious, wise. <clears throat> we want to have all these virtues of character. And it's important to us that we really have them, not just feel as if we have them. If somebody believes that he's a charitable, per charitable person, let's say, for example. Suppose he believes he's a generous person, and yet he's never performed a generous act in his life. Is his belief about himself true? No. Um, here again, the virtues are proven in action. So his belief about himself is false. Most of us don't just want to believe that we have certain virtuous traits of character. We want to actually achieve those virtues. Uh, again, as Nozick puts the point, we want to be a certain way. We care about that even more than the subjective character of our experiences, or at least that's what he, he would argue. We want to be a certain way, be a certain sort of person, not have the experience of seeming to be, not have the subjective character of feeling as if we are a certain sort of person, but actually be a certain sort of person, actually be a certain, a certain way. And again, this fact seems to show that certain traits of character w that we think of as virtues, we may care about those even more than we care about happiness. Because achieving those virtues, uh, achieving those traits of character, may involve a, a lot of effort, may involve a lot of uh, frustration uh, and disappointment. It's not always easy uh, to be uh, a truthful person, say, for example. Sometimes it's not easy to be truthful with people. It's not always um, easy to be a generous person, perhaps. Uh, all these um, require, all the virtues really require effort on our part because it's not always the easiest thing to do to be uh, a virtuous person. <clears throat> Now, if we were in the experience machine, we would only be having enjoyable experiences. But what Nozick is saying here is that much of what we want to achieve in life necessarily is accompanied by a lot of experiences that are not enjoyable. It's not easy. It's not always easy to act virtuously. Virtue, the virtues require effort, and we do care about them. We want to be a certain sort of person. We want to be a certain way, not just have enjoyable experiences. One way that Nozick puts the point is on page 22. He says, you know, a reason for not plugging into the experience machine is that uh, we want to be a certain way, to be a certain sort of person. He goes on to say that someone floating in a tank is an indeterminate blob. There is no answer to the question of what a person is like who has long been in the tank. Is he courageous, kind, intelligent, witty, loving? So here again, these would be examples of, of virtues, examples of traits of character that we all strive to develop, right? We want to be a courageous person, a kind person, an intelligent person, a witty person, a loving person. Here again, we don't just want, want it to seem to ourselves as if we are that way. We want to actually be that way. But Nozick's point is if you're just in this experience, experience machine having virtual experiences, then there really isn't any way you are. Again, he writes... Is he courageous, kind, intelligent, witty, loving? It's not merely that it's difficult to tell. There's no way he is. 
plugging into the machine is a kind of suicide. There's no way that you are, just to elaborate on what Nausicaa is saying here, there's no way that you are a courageous person if you're only having virtual, experience, virtual experiences that make you feel as if you are one. Because to develop that virtue, to develop, to acquire that virtue of character, that trait of character that we think of as virtue, being courageous, requires contact with reality. It oftentimes requires struggle uh, against the harshness of reality, doesn't it? And that goes for all of the virtues. But you're not going to be struggling against reality and all the obstacles that reality puts in our way when it comes to all the intrinsically valuable goals that we want to achieve, all the intrinsically valuable traits of character, virtues that we want to develop in ourselves, reality throws up a lot of obstacles. It's not easy to achieve anything worthwhile like that, is it? But if you're in the experience machine, you're not going to be struggling against reality. You're not going to be clashing against all the obstacles that reality puts in your way. But at the end of the day, Nozick thinks we care about those things. We care about these other things that have intrinsic value besides happiness, besides enjoyment. Nozick writes that plugging into an experience machine limits us to a man-made reality, to a world no deeper or more important than that which people can construct. There is no contact with any deeper reality. But he goes on to observe that many persons desire to leave themselves open to such contact. So what is he getting at here? Well, it's kind of connected to what I said a moment ago. The purpose of life in the sense of here again, what it is that forces us to develop strengths of character, virtues of character is of course, uh, as I said a moment ago, bound up with the struggle uh, against reality. Reality puts up all kinds of obstacles to achieving intrinsically valuable goals. Reality puts up all kinds of obstacles to becoming a certain kind of person because oftentimes to develop the virtues requires much um, effort and is not, not easy. Um, similarly, or I guess I should say in a related way, of course, a lot of people see a spiritual purpose in the struggle against reality. It may be the case that um, there is a spiritual purpose, a religious purpose, for why reality does have um, the obstacles that it does. That may be part of the divine plan for our lives. And at least that is a possibility, and it's a possibility that uh, many people, as Nozick writes here, many people desire to leave themselves open to that possibility, to the possibility that the struggle against reality, the uh, all the struggles, all the obstacles that reality puts in our way in the course of our lives, um, Many people believe that there is a spiritual purpose to all of that, that it is um, part of God's plan for our lives. Now, here again, that, that may or may not be the case, but, peop but many people want to live their lives at least open to the possibility that that is the case. But you're not going to, here again, you're not going to have that struggle against reality, and um, you're not going to develop the traits of character that, that make you a strong person as a, as a consequence if you're just living a, a life of virtual experiences in this experience machine where you never have to struggle against uh, reality, where you're just having a constant stream of enjoyable experiences, you, you, it won't ever be necessary to develop the strengths of character that we think of as virtues and to achieve the intrinsically valuable things, the, to achieve the kinds of goals that are not easy, that are valuable because they're not easy to achieve. And they trying to achieve them oftentimes involves a lot of frustration, a lot of setbacks, a lot of disappointments. But all that is a part of achieving worthwhile goals and and uh, leading truly fulfilling lives. So this religious aspect of life, of course, that may have intrinsic value as well. <clears throat> but one would lose out on such value if one were limited to the man-made virtual experiences of the machine. So there are a lot of things that may have intrinsic value besides happiness, as we've seen. It may be the case that traits of character, like wisdom uh, and prudence, judgment, truthfulness, generosity, grace, graciousness, uh, all these uh, courage, all these traits of character that we think of as strengths of character may have intrinsic value. 
uh, and may be even more important to some of us than, than even happiness. And here again, uh, being a certain kind of person has intrinsic value. And it may be the case that the religious uh, aspect of life has intrinsic value as well. Uh, of course, many people do, do believe that. And again, Nozick's point is that if you, weren't, if you weren't experiencing that friction against reality, if you, weren't, uh, if you weren't struggling against the difficulties, against the obstacles to achieving our goals that reality puts in our way, then you would lose out on at least that possibility, at least on that perspective on life, that all of that may have a spiritual meaning and purpose. But most people don't want to lose out on that. That's why another reason why Nozick thinks most people would not uh, choose to spend their lives in this experience machine. Nozick writes, we, what we want is to live ourselves in contact with reality. And this machines cannot do for us. Uh, the fact that many of us want our actions to be real, to be authentic, seems to show that other things are valuable besides happiness. So reflect on this thought experiment for yourself and think about this question. Are there other things that matter to you? Let me, let me start that again. Are there things that matter to you other than the experiences that you have? Think about that. And um, if, you, if you think of things that matter to you other than your experiences and that they are enjoyable, if there are things that matter to you about yourself more than that even, then you probably um, come down on Nozick's side of this issue uh, to do with hedonism as a, as a theory of value. Maybe you don't agree with Nozick. Maybe you do think that all that is important is that you have a, a steady stream of enjoyable experiences and whether they're real or not doesn't really make a difference to you. That's up for you to, that's up for you to decide. If, if, you're, if you would be fine with that, then you probably come down on the side of those who think that hedonism is the true theory of value. So that's a good critical thinking question for you to um, reflect on uh, when you try to assess what you take to be the philosophical uh, lesson that we should draw from this thought experiment.